So we'll move straight into our first session, looking at epistemological perspectives. And we're very fortunate to be joined by four panelists who will share with you their different disciplinary perspectives on the concept and practice of emergency. Sarah Bizan from the University of York will be talking to us about the culture of emergency and crisis. Sarah is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of York's Leverhulme Center for Anthropocene Biodiversity. And her work examines the entangled social and ecological dimensions of species loss and revival in contemporary settler colonial literature and digital cultures. Sarah is co-editor of the recently published volume, Animal Remains, in Routledge's Perspectives on the Non-Human in Literature and Culture series, along with two forthcoming special issues on coastal post-humanities for the journal Anthropocenes and Sex and Nature for the journal Environmental Humanities. Her first book, Dead Darwin, Necroecologies in Neo-Victorian Culture, is forthcoming with Manchester University Press. Peter Coventry, also from the University of York, will be discussing emergency and crisis in relation to public health. Pete is a senior lecturer in health services research at the Department of Health Sciences at York, and also co-lead of the environment and health research theme in YESI. Peter's research focuses on using epidemiological methods to understand the relationship between green and blue spaces and health and well-being, and developing applied methodologies to test the impact of nature-based activities on mental health. He has particular interest in understanding the role of nature-based solutions for promoting health and well-being among people with mental health difficulties and long-term physical conditions. His work on environment and health is underpinned by a planetary health perspective, which seeks to connect public health with ecological science to preserve and enhance population health. Mariana Barle from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro will then talk to us about emergency and crisis in environmental science and ecology. Mariana is a professor at the Department of Ecology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She holds a PhD in ecology from Duke University in the USA and is a member of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the International Coalition for Pandemic Prevention. Her research focuses on the conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services in the tropics with a focus on climate change and most recently pandemic prevention. And our final panelist in the first session is Paul Hudson. Paul is from the University of York and he will discuss emergencies from an economics perspective. Paul is a lecturer in environmental economics. He's a generalist researcher in the fields of climate change adaptation, disaster risk management and nature-based solutions for both, looking at the role of the individual in responding to the threats of climate change and disasters, and especially working on flooding. Before joining the University of York, Paul completed his PhD research into the use of flood insurance at the Institute for Environmental Studies um, at Ria Universiteit Amsterdam, after which he spent four years at the University of Potsdam's Institute for Environment and Geography's Natural Hazard Risk Research Group. So I shall now hand over to Sarah um, for our first talk. Hello, everyone. I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this international workshop um, and thanks as well to everyone participating and listening both in Brazil and the UK. I want to start out by talking about the origin of the word emergency. The original meaning of the word in Latin was defined as that which arises or comes to light. By the mid 17th century and into the 19th century, emergency also came to be associated with a watery or aqueous quality. It was defined as the rising of a submerged body above the surface of the water. Today, according to the latest edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, it is defined as an arising, sudden or unexpected occurrence. When it comes to how we define environmental emergency, I think all of us are grappling with how far reaching global phenomena like climate change, rising sea levels, mass extinctions and other environmental crises challenge the ways we understand and respond to emergencies. 
I'm particularly interested in how we might become more attuned to the ways in which emergency is expected rather than unexpected. This is because as decolonial and anti-colonial thinkers like Kyle Paus White, Malcolm Ferdinand and Juno Salazar Perenas have shown us, emergency is an occurrence foretold. Many indigenous peoples across the globe have experienced how extractive colonialism has activated a state of environmental emergency and crisis that has lasted for centuries. This is dystopia now, an ancestral, inheritable state of crisis with predictable effects upon humans, non-humans, and natural environments. As a scholar of environmental art and literature, my, focus, my work focuses on how creative practices can generate modes of cultural attention to the lasting legacies of extractive colonialism. An example of this is a recent film by Ayasha Gurin, who is a Black Studies scholar and environmental historian at the University of British Columbia, Canada. Gurin describes her film Submerged as an audio visual workbook. Drawing from archival photographs along with maritime drawings, whale sound graphs and handheld camera footage on board ferries and walking along the beach. Garen traces histories of black and indigenous whalers and their displacement from shoreline regions. Submerged is a deliberately unfinished product of an ever evolving practice of unsettling the colonial past. Through audiovisual workbooking on the shifting shoreline, Garen focuses her attention on submergence rather than emergence. For Gurin, submergence is defined as being submerged and or unseen from the perspective of land. Moving away from the epistemological ground of land and the aqueous unknown of the sea allows Gurin to focus on non-human perspectives, which are often neglected in our thinking about eco-crisis. This focus on submergence also returns us to the watery or aqueous understanding of emergence that emerged in the 17th to 19th centuries. This allows Gurin to connect the future of the environment with its colonial and maritime histories. For instance, she asks, how did the colonial whaling industries of the 18th and 19th centuries impact on whales who were removed from their watery depths to become oil for street lamps or rendered into bars of soap for the masses? Indeed, how is emergency felt by a whale who moves through the sea with the aid of eco-location and who has strong social ties to the members of its dwindling pod? Today, as a result of warming sea temperatures, ocean acidification, noise pollution, loss of habitat, and overhunting, whales and other cetacean species are under increasing threat. But by continually returning to the coastline to film her experiences on the coast and the sea, Gurin's audiovisual workbooking practice allows her to consider how environmental risk might be felt by whales as a result of the ongoing impacts of colonialism. So as we consider the meaning of environmental emergency in our discussion today, I would urge us to think about emergence as submergence. So what would it mean to submerge ourselves in the perspectives of other human and non-human animals at risk? In what ways and to what extent do non-human species respond to environmental crisis? How is emergency itself rooted in long-standing ancestral conditions of nature trauma and extractivism as a result of centuries of colonialism? And lastly, and this is an even bigger question, how might these perspectives generate empathy and compassion across the species divide in ways that inform policy, sustainable practices, or theoretical framings of environmental emergencies for the 21st century? Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so we shall move on to um, Pete, who's next, who will give us a perspective on emergency and crisis in public health. Thank you, Perrin, and thank you for this chance to be here at this webinar. So yeah, emergency framing and public health. And the climate emergency is increasingly conceived as a health emergency, and the evidence for this is stark. We know that nine out of the 10 hottest years on record have occurred in the last decade with devastating health consequences. 
Heat-related mortality among older adults has increased by more than 50% over the past 20 years, with 900 people in England alone killed by heat waves in 2019. In the US, extreme heat events have been strongly associated with higher rates of emergency room visits for mental health problems, and our own research here at York has shown that the populations exposed to flooding have higher prevalence of mental health problems, including post-traumatic stress disorder, suggesting the mental health impact of extreme weather events are both immediate and long-term. In this sense, emerg emergency framing is used to stimulate accelerated responses to protect and improve public health. And just as the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a public health emergency, there is an argument that it should now also declare climate change as a public health emergency. This approach links to the idea of grouping or bundling emergencies together, and it recognises the intersection of climate and health. And furthermore, I think it helps to draw out the difference between emergency as reaction, which focuses on responses to threats that have occurred, such as floods and wildfires, and emergency as strategy, which focuses on emergency frames to stimulate action to avoid future impacts of climate change in the absence of immediate danger. Because emergency level reactions to events like floods and heat waves are so disruptive, there might be increased willingness amongst governments to put in place long term strategic responses that prevent future but as yet unseen impacts of climate change on health. And to illustrate this further, we can point to the response to COVID 19, which did include the use of very disruptive lockdowns which are an example of emergency as reaction. And while these lockdowns were very effective, they have led to mental health problems and economic hardship. Going forwards, governments might therefore be incentivized to deliver health policy interventions that increase pandemic preparedness to minimize threats in the future. So what might be the implications of emergency framing for policy and action in response to climate change? I think the twinning of the climate emergency with the health emergency is potentially problematic. The narrative about catastrophic events like floods, fires, hurricanes, melting ice caps and so on can be at odds with the observable and lived reality of climate change. These events can be easily othered. They happen elsewhere and to other people and they can be perceived as ab abstract and intangible. Furthermore, invoking fear and crisis can be counterproductive if the dramatic effects of climate change are not immediately apparent. The concept of emergency is associated with a threat to our survival and our health, and often triggers a psychological and physiological response that we typically experience as fear and anxiety. However, we can become overwhelmed by fear, leading to paralysis and an inability to act, and people can withdraw from climate action. Or motivation for collective action might wane over time in the, in the face of sustained messaging about climate crisis and emergency. And again, going back to COVID-19, commitment to restrictions during the pandemic were not universal and lockdowns were increasingly contested despite continued framing of COVID as a public health emergency. So I think there probably is a call for more sustainable approaches to framing of climate change that can stimulate rapid but durable action to mitigate the impacts of environmental challenges to health. Framing climate change as a health issue is critical to this. Climate change as climate health can divorce climate change policy from ideological and contested contexts and support novel social and ecological perspectives such as planetary health that recognise climate as a key determinant of health. And lastly, framing climate change as a health problem makes it personal, it makes it local and relevant to today rather than an abstract event that will affect only future generations. And here, things like the Lancet Countdown can play a key role in explaining and monitoring the world's response to the health effects of climate change.
But the question for me is how do we mobilize that knowledge into action without invoking emergency frames? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, and we shall move straight on to Mariana, please. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, as, uh, as Byron has said, uh, I am from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but I'm not going to talk about the climate crisis. Because I think we've been talking a lot about the climate crisis uh, most recently, uh, especially because of the launching of the six assessment report. I'm going to talk about the biodiversity crisis. I'm an ecologist after all. So uh, I think I think we understand very well the biodiversity crisis. The number of lions in Africa, for instance, have dropped by 65%. Flying insects in Europe have dropped by 75%. Bluefin tuna by 95%, and many species have gone extinct. And the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services estimate that about 1 million species might be at risk of extinction today due to human activities. So we might be reaching the six mass extinction due to human activities. And this is clearly an emergency. And the scientific community, uh, colleges and in other disciplines have been calling the attention to the this emergency for decades now. So the Earth Summit in Rio was in 1992, and we haven't uh, progressed uh, very much since. First, we focused on the beauty of nature and charismatic species. Then we moved to a more utilitarian approach, showing how biodiversity loss affects food security, human health, climate stability, we have also proposed and evaluated solutions showing clearly that uh, they are more cost-effective than dealing with the effects of biodiversity loss. So we have gone into this, this realm of uh, like, uh, cost-effectiveness and economies. Uh, for most recently for COVID-19, for instance, my group have shown for, for example, that um, the cost of preventing pandemics from environmental actions, such as controlling deforestation, controlling wildlife trafficking, for instance, which is a major source of spillover of pathogens from wildlife to people. It's uh, less than 1% of the cost of emerging infectious diseases in general. So we have also shown during COVID that COVID-19 was being used in Brazil, for instance, we have demonstrated that it was being used in Brazil to lower environmental protection, putting indigenous people at risk. So we have the evidence, but we have been, uh, we are not being heard. So I think this is, this, is, this is the major question here. Why are we not being heard? We heard a lot that it was the fault of the scientists. So the scientists, they don't know how to communicate. Uh, they are not interested in communicating outside of academia. And I don't even think that this is the case anymore. Maybe it was the case in the past, but it's definitely not the case anymore. So why are we not being heard? So from the policy perspective, why, why are not being heard by policymakers? We, we ask ourselves in our discipline. Uh, and we often conclude that it's a problem of the timing, the time of politics, the four, it's about four years, is very uh, distangled from the timing that we need to, to propose and implement the solutions we need to address this crisis. And there is also a concern about the general public. Why is the general public not listening to that more, to this emergency crisis? And I have the feeling that we have too many crises that are overlapping. There is humanitarian crisis in many places, economic crisis, there is the climatic crisis, and then the biodiversity crisis became less of a priority. I have that strong feeling that biodiversity crisis has become less of a priority. And, and I understand why, 
Also, there is an ex excess of information that comes from conventional and social media. So we are exposed all the time by, to very shocking news and very shocking images. There is a lot of misinformation as well. And people are becoming anesthetized. So Pete has had talked uh, had had uh, talked about that. So I wonder whether this emergency discourse is helpful or not, and what will be the alternative to it? Uh, most importantly, ecologists are often we are often told, well, you know, we are people are tiring tired of hearing bad news. Can you just provide some good news, good examples of things that have worked? Of course, there are good examples of things that have worked and we have moved forward, uh, but definitely we have not moved in the speed that we need. And uh, I personally tend to be, to be positive. Uh, I think that we can, we really can address this crisis. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be working with that. I could do something else of my life. I have a lot of faith on my students and what we do. So the, the question is, how are we going to, how are we going to call the attention of society to this crisis? And more, more importantly, how are we going to provide the answers and implement those answers? And I have the strong feeling that this, the, this change that we need is not gonna come from academia and is not gonna come from the global north. So this is, this is what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariana. So our final panelist in this session is, is Paul Hudson, um, and he's going to give a perspective on emergencies from the economics discipline. Over to you, Paul. Uh, so thank you for the invite uh, to be here, and I'm probably going to talk about economics from a higher level perspective, which is going to echo quite a few of the comments we've already heard today in a way, um, because economics at its heart sees itself as trying to achieve uh, two things. One, how do you understand human behavior in response to the incentives that we face in daily life you know do you reward good things and punish bad things and then that is to try and understand how do we allocate what resources we have available to us today in order to maximize social and individual happiness well-being whatever you want to call it so whatever generates some source of value for for people uh, all too often, that can get a bit narrowly focused down into just monetary impacts, uh, financial costs. But at its heart, it should be more inclusive and a holistic understanding. It's the financial impacts, it's social consequences of your actions, stuff that we care about uh, as a society. And if we take that utilitarian perspective of trying to maximize that uh, social happiness pie to being as big as possible. If you link that to an emergency, then you see that it's got a great framing mechanism for how you would understand economics through it. Because economics, when we're looking at any long-term issue like climate change, biodiversity change, uh, economic development, is in a way incredibly optimistic. It assumes that if you create the right framework, if you provide people with the right incentives, strong enough incentives, uh, human innovation will get us out of any problem that human in innovation has also got us into uh, in the long run. And so having an emergency framework can be very useful for creating the narrative that says, yes, I as a government, I as a person need to, need to take strong action. I need to develop something. Uh, that we can address these problems. Like what Pete was saying with COVID at the start, especially when I was living in Germany, it was sold as a very strong social and moral issue to get people in order to comply with it. So going back to those incentives. And if you've got that set up well, that's gonna be good for the long run. But at the same time, framing it as an emergency is also potentially problematic. Uh, because 
the way we look at emergencies in economics is that they're, they're a short-term problem. And a lot of these issues are long-term in nature. And so if you say something's an emergency, that's great. It's tangible. It needs to be solved now. But the longer the emergency goes on, the more likely it's to become just part of our everyday life. It becomes just something that needs to be compared with, oh, we need to also work out how are we going to fund schools? How am I going to make sure my children have somewhere to live in the future? Uh, because I, f I can't remember who mentioned it, but there is only so much capacity that people have to understand information, to process the information upon which they're going to base their behavior and move and follow it into the future. So overall, uh, it's a useful idea to have this emergency framing if you want something that is short, sharp, and an immediate response. But I would say for a long-term problem, it's probably not so helpful in the long run because then it just becomes yet another problem that we have to manage with others. And then maybe something else becomes a more immediate emergency and then it gets put back onto the back burner again. And we just end up bouncing from addressing one immediate emergency to another immediate emergency uh, because what we had invested in previously and what we thought was a good idea previously doesn't look so useful in the face of the current crisis that we're facing. Uh, and that's the end for me. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so thank you to all our panelists for some really interesting perspectives, some common ground, but equally says a few um, interesting contrasts there. Um, so we'll move to our um, Q&A. Um, and do we have a first question for our panelists? I'd like to... Uh, ask a question for who is engaging this question. Uh, some of you comment about uh, this gap between the uh, the uh, scientific, scientific evidence that we are providing and the time lag that this scientific evidence is used for public policy. Uh, so my, my question is how this emergency framing could can help this process. Is framing current crisis as emergencies could help to uh, bridge this gap between uh, science and policy? Perhaps, um, perhaps Pete could answer that question. Yeah, I'll first, have a it's more directly related potentially to the, to the recent health yeah. policy issue. Yeah, I, th I think, Gabriella, if I had the answer, we wouldn't need to have this web webinar. So. Uh, I think I was hinting that, yes, that's critical. We've got the knowledge, the science is stark. It's, there's very, very clear evidence about the degradation of, of, of our uh, planetary uh, systems. And I was talking about the impacts on health and how focusing on health might make this more real for people so that people begin to take this seriously, but even that's not working. So the evidence suggests that pairing emergency climate change with emergency climate uh, health is, is also uh, not working because people become overwhelmed with the sense of anxiety and fear. And I think Paul was hinting at that too, in terms of it doesn't lead to long-term durable responses that will, will, will mitigate the impact of climate change over the long term. And I think it's about knowledge to action. How and, and, and Mariana was also talking about this, academics do engage in knowledge mobilization. We do, we do reach out and extend to uh, uh, non-academic practice. So we're getting better communicating with the science and the knowledge and the evidence. We are engaging in uh, outreach activities that, that reach out to vulnerable communities. But I guess I partly agree with Mariana that perhaps it isn't a, an academic and scientific solution. This has to be a democratic participatory approach that 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 draws together lots of different groups that that have a voice. And I suppose in part it's about how do we give that voice to to people, especially in the global south, who who might have more uh, creative solutions that go beyond technological and technocratic solutions and the top-down approach, which we've seen with COVID, which has worked with COVID because it's a short-term fix, which goes back to Paul's uh, uh, point. Uh, 
So I don't really have, I don't, I've, 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 I've skirted around giving you an answer, but uh, those are my reflections on, 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 on that question. You're on mute there, Perrin. Should we move to another question? Yeah, well, I was just seeing, Perrin, uh, questions are now emerging from the audience. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the first. I think the first that came uh, on my screen, uh, it was actually on the, on the chat box by Marcos Gonçalves. Hello, Marcos. Uh, he asks in Portuguese, I'm going to try to translate. In the face of the environmental crisis, can we discuss how the, the government investment in research uh, and can we make a comparison between investment in, ex in uh, exact science and environmental science? Can anyone, would anyone like to address this question? So um, I may ask, um, I may ask that to Paul because Paul has some experience of different, um, having worked um, in a few different countries across, across Europe in terms of the funding landscape. Paul, do you see there's, differences between different countries in the relative investments in the importance of environmental research and I suppose environmental economics research versus some of the more sort of physical sciences and and also thinking about the social sciences and humanities as well in terms of how we need to address these problems and maybe if you could answer this then we'll get um, a more of a humanities perspective from Sarah as well mm -hmm. so if you start off Paul yeah, so, so the context in which I can think out, uh, think of this is predominantly German with a bit of the Dutch because I'm new to the, the UK uh, in, a, in a roundabout way. Um, so if we look at what was in Germany, they've had some recent flood disasters uh, over the summer. And so then that gave the government a lot of incentive to invest a lot of research money into working out what happened, what went wrong, how can we do better in the future? And they did the same thing after the 2013 flood and the same thing after the 2002 flood in pretty much very similar areas. And a lot of that money, as far as I'm aware, predominantly went into progressively more social science orientated research to understand how and why people are behaving as they did, how are people understanding flood warnings and disaster stuff, and how do you communicate people to do more uh, safe behaviors uh, in a way. So over the years, I think there's definitely been a tendency in Germany to go to more social sciences and less per se, uh, the natural sciences to a certain degree, especially after a major event has occurred. Uh, and that's kind of the environment that I'm most familiar with that uh, funding in. I think that also gets to one of the questions that was asked about the, the rational thinker behavior in that we're starting to realize maybe that model isn't quite correct and we need to adjust it. Thank you, Paul. So would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, those are really good points. Um, I think about the funding structure for the Leverhulme Center for Anthropocene Biodiversity, which is a research center focused on biodiversity gains, as much as it is also focused on biodiversity losses. And I think that focus on gains is kind of strategic in a way for me as a humanities scholar, because it allows me to think about how we are, yes, rational beings, but we're also emotional beings. And, you know, being barraged with a constant reminder of loss can make us, you know, we enter into a state of emotional overwhelm that can be paralyzing. So some of the things that I focus on in my own work has been trying to um, instill some feelings of hope and excitement and enthusiasm about the ways in which humans can positively respond to biodiversity changes. Um, but yeah, I'll just leave it for there. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and Mariana, now you're, you're back with us. Um, so we were just reflecting on the relative investments in funding of different sorts of disciplinary perspectives in the different countries. So it would be interesting yeah. to have a perspective, perspective on the Brazilian funding situation in terms of the investments in this area into more physical sciences versus environmental sciences versus social mm -hmm. sciences and humanities. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear what my, my colleagues, panelists have uh, said, but I, I, I believe that people here in this, uh, in this audience uh, 
knows uh, of the, the financing crisis and emergency that we are having in Brazil now. So we had like dramatic drop in uh, funding for science in general uh, since uh, 2013. And this has uh, worsened and worsened. And uh, I think that more than, a, than a, uh, a the difference between the, the amount of funding that goes into uh, exact sciences and natural science, environmental sciences, we have a very big gap on the human. Uh, on humanities. So there is uh, a clear policy uh, of the current uh, federal government uh, against uh, the, the production of knowledge in humanities. And this, in the context of our panel here, is, uh, is extremely worrisome, as uh, we have said a, a number of times here. Uh, Apparently, the problem is not really about how much science we have on environmental issues. It's, it's about people. How do we engage people? And this type of this type of knowledge is not gonna come from the exact science nor the the natural science. This comes from humanity. So this is this is very worrisome. Thank you, Marianne. I think we have time for one one question before we end this session. Gabriela, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> now we have lots of questions here, but one of them is from Rob Markant. He doesn't he didn't specify who should respond, but the, the question is: do people see examples of good leadership to act as beacons of hope in moving us toward more sustainable futures? And also, Pira, I have another question that's quite interesting too from Anonymous, <laughs> how much the reason behind the emergency frame relies on the rational decision maker model and what are the limitations of that? Again, for anyone who would like to respond. So, so would anyone like to offer any response on either the, um, the, the idea of the rational decision maker? Maybe that might be one for you, Paul, given the economics framing. Um, and these, the need for good leadership. So we'll start with Paul and then see if anyone wants to contribute extra. Yeah, so speaking as the economist, like utilitarian rationalism is all the way, is, the, is simply the best. But uh, yeah, in reality, I think what we're seeing with a lot of climate change and emergencies like what we're discussing here today, it, it is becoming a lot less of a relevant framework to assume that if you just inform somebody, that if you tell them about the costs and the benefits abstractly, uh, that is going to be enough to convince people to change their behaviors, uh, especially as we tend to look at it as I think I can't remember who said it in the comments in the chat window, you know, people tend to then have to look at the thing one at a time in terms of disasters in terms of potential risks and not collectively with everything as well because the rationalist thinking approach likes to look at one problem at a time in economics and not necessarily how they all intersect with each other and then if you're looking at long-term planning for climate change you have discounting in order to work out how do you value future impacts put it down today you can argue that's not that's only a rational uh, idea of counting when you've got predictable and consistent impacts, which is not true for climate change, especially in the far future. So it, it's kind of something I see that does play a role still today, but something that we will have to move away from in order to better stimulate sustainable action. So can, you, can you help with the, the first question? I didn't hear it well about leadership. Yeah. Uh, do people see examples of good leadership to act as beacons of hope and move us toward, towards more sustainable futures? Yeah. I, I, can I address that one? Yes, please, Maria. I, Go ahead. I, I, get, I get personally inspired by the youth. All the movements that I see uh, of the youth, for instance, uh, Greta Thunberg, I think that she makes or she makes much more of a of a substantial change than all the science that uh, 
than all the science that the IPCC has generated, right? And we had our report had like 10,000 pages on the, the, three, the three volumes. Uh, we provide all the, all the technical supports that governments need, but uh, leaders like this, they call the attention that is necessary to make the change. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about our youth. I think our, I, I have a lot of hope uh, in, the, in them. Thank you, Mariana. I think with that optimistic note, we might, we might end this session there. So thank you very much um, to our panelists.